taking part of this webinar. Um, before beginning uh, our topic, which will be uh, understanding the protocol of Cartagena, I would like to make some introduction to the webinar. So first, uh, I would like to present myself. Uh, my name is Maria de Burgues Torres. I have a PhD in plant molecular biology. Uh, currently, I work as a professor and researcher at the Universidad San Francisco de Quito in Ecuador, so hi from Ecuador. Uh, and I uh, working also as a regional advisor in the BCH project. Um, first, uh, we will talk a little bit about how to use uh, the go to webinar control panel, and then we will say a little bit about the BCH uh, project phase two. Uh, and a very important point in these projects has been the development of a bunch of educational materials. That we are going, that maybe some of you already know, and that we are going to present uh, very shortly in this uh, introduction. So first, um, uh, now uh, you are seeing my screen, and always you are going to be um, to be seeing this part of what I'm uh, presenting. But you also have this attendant control panel. So this is also very important that, that you get familiarized with this control. Uh, in this in this part, you have uh, this option view uh, when all these checks are open. So please uh, maintain and check this option, uh, this auto hide the control panel in order that you can also always have access to the panel and you can uh, access to it and, for example, afterwards um, make a question or or write whatever you you need to. So in this, in your control panel, uh, this is a quick bar. This uh, yellow uh, box with an arrow, uh, or orange uh, box with an arrow, is to show or hide the control panel. This is a very important uh, part. Is uh, when you uh, click on it, you can raise your hand, and then we could, could notice that you have any question or any doubt about the, the seminar. Um, uh, also, this in the, in the lowest part, you have this square uh, for questions. So you can write uh, the question in this box and then send it, and we will notice that you have any requirement in this uh, webinar. It's very important that you notice that this webinar is being recorded uh, and played back. Uh, the webinar will be recorded for later publication in an open domain as part of the BCH educational materials. Uh, when participating in this webinar, you understand and implicitly accept this. The participants' opinion and the concepts expressed during this webinar do not reflect the unique official position about any subject or matter. This is very important that you take notice of this point. So if you require official statements about any aspect related to the Cartagena Protocol, uh, this will, should be requested uh, from the only UNEP official representative, that is the Secretary of the Convention of the Biological Diversity. So please uh, take note of this point too. Um, as you uh, may be seen in your, in your screen, there is a red light uh, which indicates that the webinar is being recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, maintain the micro muted and don't share your screen. So, um, talking about the, the BCH project, um, it's important to uh, review the overall objective, which is to continue assisting eligible countries in the strengthening national capacities to effectively access and use the BCH, promoting regional and sub-regional collaboration, ne networking, and exchange of experience for national and regional BCH management. Uh, the BCH project components in this phase two have several components, uh, five, but uh, now I like to stress component two, which is continued in-depth fine-tuning and development of knowledge sharing training packages on the BCH in five UN languages, which are Arabic, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. So uh, that's why in, uh, during this project, uh, we can access to this virtual learning environment. Uh, you are seeing in your screen the address, uh, how to access this learning environment, which is uh, uh, Moodle 
dot bch dot cbd dot in uh, and I like to show you how this uh, page sees so wait a sec so here if you if you enter to the uh, virtual uh, learning environment you are going uh, this page is going to appear uh, and then you will be asked for a username and a password if you don't have still a username and a password uh, I, I will tell you later what you have to do but uh, until you have this information you always can log in as a guest when you log in then you could you will access the, the, the main uh, page of this uh, learning environment and then you can see at the left hand side the all the all the countries where um, learning uh, workshops has been uh, done but also in the central part you can see all these boxes uh, where you can find if you click on, on one of these boxes you can access all the training materials as I already told in different languages for example English Spanish uh, French so if you click in one of these boxes you could access uh, all these uh, learning materials that have been developed and also now in the in the right hand side you also have uh, the, the links that will take you to all the webinars these uh, virtual uh, meetings that we are having right now if you want to hear again or if you want to access other different uh, webinars that has been uh, taking place during this time so go back, going back to um, this presentation, I just want to to add that if you go to the to this address, then oh excuse me, um, then uh, as I told you, if you haven't been registered yet, uh, you have to to ask for the username and password, sending an email to Moodle. Um, bch2project.org uh, and then you have to put your name, your surname and the country and then you will uh, get back uh, an email with the username and the, uh, and then you will go to this learning environment. Uh, so um, until now is there any question before end, uh, reviewing the Cartagena protocol? Andrew, Gato, do you have any any doubt, any 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 question? Okay, so let's continue. Uh, before going to um, the, the the Cartagena protocol, I also like to welcome uh, Ernesto. Ernesto, as you know, everybody knows Ernesto. He's a very important person in these webinars and, and in actually in all the <laughs> development of the BCH project. So, um, Ernesto, please, would you like to, to welcome the participants? Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for participating today in this new webinar about the Cartagena Protocol. Uh, we will continue doing these webinars uh, for the benefit of countries. So, uh, I, I appreciate very much if you send us your comments and suggestions for improvement. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. So now uh, we're going to be talking the, the next uh, 30 minutes probably about the Cartagena pro protocol. In, uh, in this talk, I will make some stops after some sections in order that if you have any, any question, uh, please go ahead and just ask. Uh, uh, one of the main objective, objectives of these webinars is that you can ask any doubt that you have and we can talk and, you know, like, uh, we can have a like, small conversation. So the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. Um, in this talk, we're going to talk about the background, I, which gives a rise to the protocol. So we're going to talk about the Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, uh, and then going in the Cartagena Protocol, uh, we would like to stress, to stress what is the purpose of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety and how does the Cartagena, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety works. Um, give me a second, second. Some key elements that we would like that to have very clear at the end of this webinar. We would like that everybody uh, knows about what exactly is the Advanced Import Agreement procedure, which is a procedure 
that the protocol establishes for animals for living modified organisms for intentional introduction into the environment. So the advance in foreign agreement is a very important procedure uh, that is in the Cartagena Protocol. The other uh, very important uh, uh, topic is LMOs we are going to be used for direct use as food or feed or for processing. And of course, we will also uh, like that everybody has a clear idea about the uh, information sharing and the biosafety clearinghouse, the BCH, the types of data that there are in this um, information sharing mechanism and how to use this data. So we're going to be talking about the living modified organisms and it's very important that everybody has a clear idea of what, what is such an organism. So I'm, I will going to read the definition that it is in the Cartagena Protocol, which says a living modified organism is any living organism that possesses a novel combination of genetic material obtained through the use of modern biotechnology. Okay, which is the origin of the protocol? The origin of the pro protocol, as I already said, is the Convention of Biological Diversity. In this a convention, in Article 8G, it is stated, establish or maintain means to regulate, manage, or control the risk associated with the use and release of LMOs resulting from biotechnology we are likely to have adverse environmental impacts that could affect the conservation and the sustainable use of biological diversity, taking also into account the risk to human health. And also in Article 19.3, it is stated that the parties should consider the need for a protocol setting out appropriate procedures, including in particular advanced informed agreement in the field of the safe transfer, handling, and use of any LMO resulting from biotechnology that may have adverse effects on conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity. So, as you can see here in the convention, um, there is the need to establish a protocol, and that is why um, the Protocol of Cartagena was developed. The Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety is an international agreement, it's a treaty concluded and adopted in the framework of the Convention of the Bi on Biological Diversity. So this is one of the first points we have to have very clear. This uh, protocol was adopted in January 29 in, in the year 2000, but it entered into force on September 11, 2003. Until May uh, 2013, there are 166 parties that are uh, that are part of this protocol. Uh, I was uh, checking this information yesterday because this number changes from one month to another, and in January it was 164 parties, but at the end of May uh, there are going to be 166 parties, being the last party to, to join the protocol, Afghanistan. Okay, the protocol has a way to be administrated. It is a, a protocol that has been uh, worked by other countries which are part of this uh, protocol. So every, uh, nowadays, every year, every two years, sorry, um, the parties come together in these meetings that are called the COP mobs. So uh, during the COP mobs, there's a meeting of all the parties taking part of the protocol, and they talk about how to improve the protocol, how the protocol is working, and all these uh, topics uh, in order to achieve very results of uh, having this protocol. So as you, as you can see, there has been like six COP mobs, the last one in India uh, in two, uh, 2012, and the next one will be in two, 2014. How does the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety work? In general terms, the protocol set out general obligations and principles that are applicable to all LMOs. The protocol establishes specific rules and procedures that are applicable to the transboundary movement of specific categories of LMOs. 
It also establishes institutional arrangements for the administration, oversight, and future evolution of the protocol, and makes provision for capacity building and financial resources to assist uh, mainly developing countries and countries with economies in transition to implement the protocol. So these are, are, all these points are also very important to have a feeling of, that, of, 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 what, of how the protocol works. When you are analyzing an international treaty, I think it's very, very important that the objective of this treaty is very clear. In this case, this, this is described in Article 1. The objective of this protocol is to contribute to ensuring an adequate level of protection in the field of the safe transfer, handling, and use of living modified organisms resulting from the modern biotechnology that may have that may have adverse effects on the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity, taking also into account risks to human health and specifically focusing on transboundary movements. So this focus is very important also that it's very clear. The focus of this protocol is on transboundary movements. Talking about LMOs, that means when an LMO leaves one country and enters another one. <coughs> In Article 4, uh, the scope of the protocol is described. This protocol shall, shall apply to transboundary movement, transit, handling, and use of all living modified organisms that may have adverse effects on the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity, taking also into account risks to human health. Okay, mainly the scope and the application of the Cartagena Protocol goes to these two very important chapters. The LMOs that are going to be introduced intentionally into the environment and the, and the LMOs that will be used for direct use as food, feed, or processing. So these two different sections have to be very clear. Also, it's important to notice what is stated on Article 5. Protocol should not apply to the transboundary movement of living modified organisms which are pharmaceuticals for humans that are addressed by other relevant international agreements or organizations. Okay, so now uh, I will going to explain the first big uh, section of this protocol that is about the application of the advanced import agreement. But before going to this topic, I would like to know if you have any questions. So please, if you have any question, please uh, say it. Okay. Um, I don't see any requests. So I will continue. Mar Maria, excuse me, I have a hand uh, raised by uh, Mr. Gado Saki. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gado, Mr. do you Gado have Saki. a question? Okay, now the hand is not raised anymore. <laughs> okay, so I will continue. Please, um, whenever you need, just write, raise your hand and uh, any question is very welcome. Um, oh, excuse me. So, going to what is the advanced informed agreement procedure, this is described in Article 7 and in also in Article 8, 9, 10, and 12. Um, this procedure shall apply prior to the first intentional transboundary movement of living modified organisms for intentional introduction into the environment of the party of import. Very important. This procedure has to be applied, or shall be applied, before the first intentional transboundary movement of a living modified organism for intentional introduction into the environment. So that means that the party of import has to be notified about the proposed import. This party shall receive also full information about the LMO 
and its intended use. And the party also will assess the risk associated with the LMO and then after the um, analysis, uh, the party should decide also whether or not to allow the import. So in this uh, diagram, uh, maybe you can see um, what is this uh, procedure. So one of the first steps is the notification. During the notification, the exporter has to inform the import country about the activity, the movement of an LMO from the exporter country to the importer country. Second, the country of import has to make this a knowledge reception. Uh, that means uh, when the country of import receives this notification, uh, there's going to receive a lot of information and they have to review this information and take a decision if they are ready to begin, you know, the risk analysis of all this information. Uh, and then for this knowledge reception, the country of import has 90 days. After, uh, after this, uh, the risk assessment uh, begins to, to work and the whole procedure can last up to 270 days. In these 270 days, all the assessment has to be done and in, in this uh, time frame, there is any question, there is a request of additional information, the country of import can ask for new information or for incomplete information to the country of export. So if there is a request of additional information, this uh, clock of 270 days can stop. For example, if in day number 100 there is a need of additional information, then the watch stops until the country of import has the information it needs for uh, doing the risk analysis. Very important, the whole, the whole procedure can last up to 270 days uh, and this procedure leads to a decision after the 270 days, a decision has to be made. We can be approving the import or prohibiting the import. Uh, there are some exceptions to this procedure. Um, for example, uh, the LMOs which are in transit, LMOs destined for contained use uh, in the party of import, LMOs intended for direct use as food or feed or for processing, or LMOs excluded by any COFMOF decisions. Until now, there is no COFMOF decision excluding any, uh, any LMOs from this procedure, but maybe in the future. So very important, the advanced inform uh, um, procedure, it is applied for LMOs for intentional introduction into the environment. This is not applies, I mean, the, pro the protocol that, that not apply this procedure to these LMOs in transit, LMOs in contained use, or LMOs that are going to be used as food, feed, or process. This also is a point that has to be very clear. And the other big chapter is the LMOs intended for direct use as food, feed, or processing, which is described in Article 11. So Article 11 refers to LMOs that may be subject to transboundary movement for direct use for food, feed, or processing. Very important to stress, these LMOs are not intended to be introduced into the environment. Okay, so uh, learning about this, um, this point, um, a party that makes a final decision regarding domestic use, including placing on the market of an LMO that may be subject to transboundary movement for direct use as food, feed, or processing, shall, within 15 days of, of making the, that decision, inform to the parties through the BCH. Okay, so very important. The protocol requires that if a 
party is going to use an LMO as food, feed, or, process, or, 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 or processing, then the only obligation that this country has is to inform through the PCH within the 15 days after a party makes a final decision on this issue. In Article 11.5, uh, uh, it is said, each party shall make available to the biosafety and greenhouse uh, copies of any national laws, regulations, and guidelines applicable to the import of LMOs intended for direct use as food or feed or for processing if available. This requirement goes with what I said before, because the decision in this topic has to be done using national legislation. So that is why it's important that in the BCH, these laws or these regulations can be shared with other countries. Another very important point is Article 11.6. In the absence of a domestic regulatory framework, framework and in exercise of it, its domestic jurisdiction, a country can declare through the BCH that its decision prior to the first import of a living modified organism intending for direct use as food or, or feed or for processing will be taken according to the following. A risk assessment undertaken in accordance with Annex 3 of the protocol and a decision made within a predictable time frame not exceeding 270 days. So this is also very important to, that it has to be very clear. This is not an obligation. This is a de decision that can, every country can do, for example, if they don't have national regulations in place. So if they think that they need to make a risk assessment and to make a decision prior to the first import of a living modified organism that is going to be used as feed, food, or processing, they can use the information in Annex 3 and they can take 270 days to make a decision. What is important is that the decision applying the, uh, the national regulation or applying what is uh, established in 11.6 uh, will be reported to the BCH within a frame of 15 days. So talking about the two uh, issues that have been, uh, I have been explaining, uh, I would like that it's very clear. First one, the advanced the AIA procedure is a bilateral procedure which is based on the on the recommunication between parties. Party of export, party of import, the party of import receive the information and make the risk assessment uh, after 270 days, uh, 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 find a decision, take a decision, and this decision, of course, has to also to be, uh, excuse me, to be re uh, uh, reported to the BCH. The other procedure is essentially a multilateral information exchange mechanism centered on the BCH. This is a country itself decides what to do with an LMO that is going to be used for food, feed, or processing. Uh, the country takes its decision, and this decision is uh, put in the BCH. So um, these two points have to be very clear. So please, um, if you have any question, uh, I will be very glad to answer. There are any doubt? It's very clear that these two uh, big uh, big topics on on the protocol. Okay, I don't see any any request, so I will continue. Besides the 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 things that we were talking about, it's also interesting to analyze article. 12, which, which is about review of decisions. Um, in A, it says a party of import may at any time in light of new scientific information 
review and change a decision. And also, a party of export or a notifier may also request the party of import to review its decision if there is a change in circumstances or new information becomes available. So biotech is always changing and there are always new information and if there is any new information, a decision can be changed. Article 15 talks about risk assessment. Risk assessment undertaken percent to this protocol shall be carried out in a scientifically sound manner in accordance with Annex 3. This is also a very important point. Risk assessment is essential for taking a decision, but this uh, analysis has to be done in a scientific sound. And a uh, guidance to do it in a correct way is what is um, described in Annex 3, which is a lot, uh, you can re uh, review this annex uh, after this webinar, but you can see that in this annex there are like very concrete points of information needed to make the risk analysis and to arrive to a final decision. <clears throat> Another very important article is Article 17, which is about unintentional transboundary movements. Okay, so an unintentional transboundary movement can, is related uh, with some uh, accidents. So there is a party that released unintentionally an LMO. In this um, photo, you can see there's a river between the two countries and maybe there is a, a living modified fish which can, you know, uh, go away of the country of the first party. If this happens, if this such a uh, uh, transboundary movement happens, then the party that released the LMO has to immediately contact the party potential affected. Uh, when the, the party contacts the potential affected party, uh, some information has to be given, like the quantities of the LMO, the characteristics, the data of the release, the circumstances, and the possible risks. Um, so the two countries have to begin a conversation to determine appropriate uh, responses, including emergency measures, establish agreed solutions, and develop joint plans of action. Of course, this type of movements has also uh, has to be reported to the DCH. Okay, in this case, and I will be talking later also about the national focal points, but there is a fo national focal point for emergency activities. So it's very important that every country has assigned a person, an institution, that is, is in charge of this uh, type of emergencies. Because it's very important that if such an event occurs, the party that released the LMO knows exactly which institution, which person has to be reached in the potentially affected party. So, when a country uh, agrees to be part of an international treaty, there are some obligations. In this case, upon ratification and entry into force of the protocol in a country, each party must first designate one national focal point to be responsible on its behalf for liaison with the protocol secretariat. Another focal point is the one in charge of the biosafety clearinghouse mechanism. Also, to uh, uh, have contact with the secretary regarding issues of relevance to the development and implementation of the DCH. The third uh, national focal point is the one that has to be contact uh, uh, for receiving notification from other parties of an international transboundary movement, as I already said. So, for every country where there is um, the, the protocol has entered into force, three national focal points has to be designated. The one that is responsible of the protocol, the one in charge of the BCH, and the one uh, that has to be contacted in, in cases of unintentional transboundary movement. 
So uh, the names and the addresses of these national focal points has to be sent to the Secretariat uh, in order that the information can be available at the BCH. There is also an obligation that every country has to um, designate also competent national authorities that are going to be char in charge of this topic. Other procedures, uh, of, uh, excuse me, other articles that are in interesting in this protocol. Uh, these are Article 13, which, is, which talks about a simplified procedure. As I already said, uh, the, uh, the AIA procedure uh, ha happens or it has to be done before the first uh, transboundary movement of a specified LMO. But if, you, if a country is going to import the same LMO a second, a third time, does not have to repeat all this procedure again. And then it can go and read what happens in Article 13, which is describing a simplified procedure to uh, the next uh, intentional uh, transboundary movements of a specific uh, LMO. Article 18 talks about handling, transport, packaging, and identification of LMOs. This article has been uh, very well worked in the COP MOPs. The idea is that when LMOs for different um, activities are going to enter a country, when they are entering the country as an, a result of an importation, uh, there has the, the elements has to be uh, uh, going together with some information. So which information is accompanying an LMO that's going to be used for intentional introduction to the environment? So in this article, there is clearly stated which information has to accompany or an LMO for intentional use, uh, uh, introduction to the environment, or when it's going to use as a food feeder processor, or when it's going to be used for contained use. So it's very interesting if you have a look of a, on this Article 18. Article 27 talks about liability and redress. This is a topic that has been very uh, broadly discussed in the, uh, during the COP mobs. Uh, there was a big discussion on this topic and after a lot, a lot of conversations uh, in uh, 2010 in Japan, there was agreed a uh, for a new supplementary protocol dealing with liability and redress. So this supplementary protocol is establishing uh, some rules and guidances, guidelines to how to, to handle if there is a, a damage caused by an LMO uh, and you know who is liable and who, uh, how the redress has to be done. This supplementary protocol has not yet entered into force. Uh, parties are analyzing and considering if they are going to ratify this new international uh, treaty. Also, and before finishing, it's very, very important what is stated in Article 20. A BCH is hereby established as part of the clearinghouse mechanism in order to, very important, facilitate the exchange of scientific technical, environmental, and legal information on an experience with LMOs and assist parties to implement the protocol, taking into account the special needs of develop developing countries' parties. So, for building a very strong biosafety in clearinghouse, the parties to the protocol have to make certain information available through the BCH, such as national laws and regulations, national contacts, countries' decisions, LMO risk assessment, regional, bilateral, and multilateral agreements. Uh, and all this, this information has to be sent to the BCH, as I say, in order to have more information and in order that the BCH is a very good guide for the work that has been done, that has to be done in every country. Before ending, this um, webinar, I just want to show you, um, of course, how the biosafety in clearinghouse, of course, uh, or the participants has been 
uh, have been entering the biosafety greenhouse, but there you have the, the main page. And just to know, uh, for example, if you go to finding information uh, and you want to know about the, all the LMOs that um, that you need to, there's a very long list about how to access uh, whatever um, LMO that has been reported to the BCH. So the BCH is a, a big bank of data, very important for the countries to work with it and to make decisions in having these guidance. So I don't know if, or I hope you have any, uh, some questions. I will be very glad before ending this webinar to answer any doubt uh, you have. So is there any, any suggestion, any, any request, any doubt? Ernesto, maybe see, you want to add something. I see no questions uh, from the audience, uh, Maria. Um, could you please uh, just uh, uh, explain a, little, a bit more what would be the, the situation of a country um, when, uh, for example, a, a new LMO has been put in the market for, uh, by uh, an exporter, I mean another country, and uh, this other country has just uh, complied with the Cartagena Protocol and has published this new LMO uh, in less than 15 days in the BCH. What would be the situation in a, in a, in a eventually or potentially importing country? Okay, uh, the export party put the information in the BCH? Or the import yes, yes, party? Yes, the, the exporter has already published the information about the, the new LMO on the BCH uh, for full for full feed and processing. Okay, then the, the I mean the export party uh, do his do uh, do his work, and the import party has to review this information, and of course uh, the, the the country of import um, has to know if, if the country wants to make a risk assessment, want to uh, apply its national regulation and uh, wants to make a decision about the use of this uh, specific LMO. Yes, I mean, if, if the country does not have a, a, a specific framework that uh, considers uh, LMOs for full feed and processing, then they should be uh, watching the BCH continuously. Uh, could you please talk a bit uh, to the participants about what are the, the, the different functionalities that the BCH has in order to help people to know or the, that uh, there are new decisions, like for example the, the mailing lists and the, the RSS feeds, because if not, uh, country offices would have to be uh, monitoring the BCH in order to be uh, warned against the, the the appearance of a new a, a new LMO in the market that could enter the country. Yeah, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, what you are saying, um, and I am uh, putting on the screen again the the main uh, page of the BCH. Uh, you know, um, there are uh, in the in the first when you enter the BCH, there are these latest news, the latest additions, the latest updates where there is the new information that has been registered in the BCH. So if any country wants to know what has happened um, in the last uh, days, uh, this, uh, uh, the person can review this uh, news where, uh, as I say, the last uh, very important uh, event can, has to be notified. Of course, there is also a, you can you can be any person can ask the BCH to send an email with the last updates. This is also very informative and very easy because you don't have to go to the BCH. Then you receive to your email address the latest updates of, on the BCH, which immediately tell the, the the person that receives these emails what has happened in the last uh, uh, days, uh, which new uh, LMO has been released, uh, well, wh which country had uh, joined the protocol, or any very important news about the, uh, 
the information that is handled in the biosecurity greenhouse. Yes, and uh, if you if you show the the bottom of that the main page, you will also if you show the bottom of that main page, I I am not seeing yeah. your in more to the uh, bottom. Yeah, okay. There you have some links. Yeah. Where it says yeah. RSS. Those are the the feeds that you can you can get on your on your feed feed reader or on your news reader any news reader. If you yeah. if 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 the participant if, if a person wants to be wanted of any news about the the BCH, this is a very simple way of doing that also because you can use any any feed reader like the Mozilla one or, or even in Outlook, you can have your your news there. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I don't know if there. Any request? Any question? So I don't so there's a hand by request. Andrew. So, ah, okay, Mr. Yep. Andrew up here. Okay. So please go ahead. Do you have a micro? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to find out in cases of uh, unintentional introduction during transboundary movement of an LMO, uh, who is responsible for the cost involved in addressing the problem? Is it the, the country of, ex, uh, the, the exporting country or the importing country? Thank you. Okay, if there is an unintentional transboundary movement um, yes. uh, established in the protocol, is that the yeah. cost where, that, where it happens, the release has to contact the uh, country, the, the potentially, potentially affected country. And then together they have to arrive to uh, uh, common activities will try to uh, stop uh, the, this unintentional release. Actually, it is not stated in the protocol who has to pay for these actions. Um, an unintentional uh, release does not mean immediately a damage. Uh, so, uh, so maybe you have to do, take some uh, some actions, but maybe these actions doesn't have to be related with damage. If there is a damage uh, produced by the LMO itself to the environment, and now there are some, as I told you, some guidelines or some uh, procedures established in this supplementary protocol. But this supplementary protocol until now has not entered into force. So, so there is no international obligation or no international um, document establishing who has to pay this uh, uh, if there's a damage or, uh, that happens because of an unintentional movement. Thank you. Okay? Yep, thank you. Okay. So is there any other question? Okay, so if there is no more questions, um, I would really like to thank uh, the participants to this webinar. I hope that I uh, made myself clear and that you um, had uh, clear uh, information about the main issues uh, that uh, deals in the Cartagena protocol. So thank you very much for participating. Um, I hope uh, you are doing very well and have a good day, uh, a very good day. So Ernesto, would you like to say something else? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much everybody for participating in this new webinar and thank you very much also for your questions that are always very important for us and for the rest of the participants. See you in the next webinar then. Have a nice day. Thank you very much uh, Maria also for this webinar. Okay, bye everybody.